Focus International is a mergers and acquisition company which is primarily focused on, but not limited to, acquiring and growing tech and manufacturing businesses globally. Since its founding in 2021, Islas has acquired several businesses and is in the process of developing these businesses while completing other acquisitions as well. So with me is John Paul Backwell, the Managing Director at Islas. So great to have you here in New York, I, you're living in the UK. I so, am, yes. Yeah. yeah. Th so thank just, you very much for having me. Yeah. yeah it's great to have you here and just give me an overview of Islas International. What's the mission of the company? So we're typically focused on acquiring and growing companies that have that X factor of technology in their sector or have the potential to develop that in the sector that they're in. We've got four subsidiaries and each have got their own very specific mission. So firstly, our emergency response subsidiaries focused on protecting and saving lives and protecting the lives of our, you know, our heroic first responders. We've got our defense subsidiary, again, focused on protecting warfighters on technology that protects us from the likes of terror threats and so forth. We've got our industrial subsidiary that's focused on the credit manufacturing critical infrastructure that we actually rely on, you know, for heating, cooling our homes, for transportation. And then we've got a renewable subsidiary focused on more efficient means of, of environmental recycling, so recycling e-waste and, and things like that. So kind of a conglomerate. Essentially a conglomerate, of yes. Of a so lot of different we, growing industries. Yeah, and we'd like it to become a conglomerate which is really making a positive impact. Ah, got it. So um, what do you look for when you are acquiring a company? So essentially, we're looking for companies that are uh, aligned with our mission uh, that, that, are, that I've just mentioned. Uh, in, the, in the emergency response space, we're looking for that disruptive technology. Uh, we've got firefighting equipment businesses. Um, in defense, we're looking for more smarter technology that will protect warfighters and things like that. So businesses really need to have, as I said, that X factor, that disruptive technology. They also need to have a strong balance sheet. Uh, they need to have strong management or potential to for us to be able to put strong management in place and, and, and things like that. So that makes sense, yeah. Are there, are, we've heard a lot of talk about AI this year. Are there areas of tech that you see really growing or areas of manufacturing that are growing right now? Yeah, so we, I mean, AI is obviously actually an important focus area of our business, but there's a lot of, I mean, we, we focus primarily on manufacturing businesses and manufacturing that disruptive technology. We like to own the technology uh, that we're selling into the market. So in the emergency response sector, for example, we're seeing a huge growth area where there's a shift from larger, less efficient, more expensive vehicles to smaller, what we call rapid intervention, rapid response vehicles. So you'll know that, you know, if someone is in cardiac arrest or if there's a road traffic collision, a structural fire, if there was a fire in this building, response time of the emergency service is critical, right? But if they're coming down the road in a massive truck that's struggling to get through the congested areas of New York, of course, that's, that's why there's a growth area, there's a shift towards rapid response vehicles. In defense, certainly there's a shift towards AI, there's a shift towards smarter technology to protect war fighters. Obviously, there's less troops in Afghanistan as, an, as a practical example, right? So there's more, they're looking at more technology that can actually be used in, in the war zones, obviously, you know, acting from a distance, so to speak. In the renewable sector, you know, we talk about more efficient means of recycling, how do we dispose of lithium batteries, for example, when they reach the end of their lifespan? And, and those types of problems that we're focusing on, that's where there's obviously huge, huge growth areas for us as a business. Really interesting. What have been some of your previous acquisitions? So we've been going for a little over two and a half years since we acquired uh, or since we took over from previous management. We've, we've acquired nine companies since then and we've incorporated a further four. So there's th 13 all in the group. Uh, we started in the emergency response sector with a company called Firebug. And that, that company manufactures very disruptive firefighting technology. I'll give you a practical example. It uses water mist technology to put out fires as opposed to large volumes of water. So water mist can actually extinguish any class of fire um, as opposed to having to use chemical agents, foam, uh, dry powder, things like that. So uh, very disruptive in terms of its technology. We then went on to acquire fire protection businesses, uh, vehicle conversion businesses, all in that emergency response space. And then in 2022, we acquired a public company called, well now called Quality Industrial Corp. We changed the name from Wikisoft to Quality Industrial Corp. We changed the ticker to QIND. And we acquired that company to use it as a special purpose vehicle to do further acquisitions in the industrial sector. And through that, that vehicle, we've acquired 52% of a company called Quality International. So it, it's a business that had a $270 million valuation. So quite a large operation, 10 million square feet of manufacturing facilities in Dubai. 
And that company is really, you know, growing uh, over $100 million of purchase orders currently in production. As I said, we've incorporated some businesses too. We've got the defense division. We incorporated a company called Hyperion Defense Solutions. They've got some very innovative tech that, uh, that they distribute. So they've got global exclusive rights to it. Uh, and then the renewable sector, which is involved in the in the urban mining business, so quite quite broad. We've got you know quite a broad focus, but all very yeah. important. Well, aspects. they're all innovative, very, all doing very innovative so. things. Yeah. And so that's been core to to our core principle throughout. Yeah, yeah that's really your your mission, exactly, right? So, yeah. um, how have these acquisitions met your expectations? Have they exceeded? I mean, what has been the result of these? Would you say? Sure, sure. I mean, it's been a challenging road for us, you know, in, in having you know quite diverse businesses. Uh, not everything's been easy, uh, which, which is uh, you know, quite obvious, but uh, we, we've certainly had businesses that our, our industrial subsidiary has certainly far exceeded our expectations. We always knew it was going to essentially perform the best for us in the short term. And, and that's obviously why we entered that industrial sector. But now it's got $200 million of purchase orders in hand, as I said, $100 million of, of, of orders currently in production. And that's really where it's surpassed our expectations. It's definitely growing faster than we expected it to. We expected a resurgence after COVID, but not as much and as quickly as we've seen it in that, industri in that industrial sector. And then here close to home in the US, our firefighting distribution business, that doubled its revenue last year. Bearing in mind that we grew over 600% last year, did 78 million revenue. So we, we did grow a lot in, in 2022. And then our, our defense divisions, also the, the demand and the growth in that defense division for that counter ID technology, that smart technology that we sell, uh, obviously also su surpassing expectations. Now, I know you have offices all over the world. Are there areas of the world that you see are growing faster, either either due to COVID or not due to COVID, <laughs> just because of other policies? Yeah, yeah. certainly. The, the Middle East economy uh, across the Middle East and regions definitely booming at the moment. I'm not sure how, how noticeable that is from here in the US, but it certainly is booming. And that's why we've got a number of acquisitions. We're actually headquartered in Dubai, so we're well positioned to tap into that growth that's taking place in the Middle East, particularly in Saudi Arabia at the moment. Also, southeastern Europe. I'm not sure if people are aware, but there's a lot of growth taking place in southeastern Europe. So, so that would be which countries? So Serbia, Romania, okay. um, Croatia, those basically. countries oh, yeah. coming down towards Greece, and things like that. A lot, a lot of growth definitely taking place there. It's the reason we have our e-vehicle. We've got commercial electric utility vehicles that we manufacture in Serbia. Uh, we get we get millions of dollars of government incentives in, in doing that, but we're positioned alongside a number of large global manufacturers, automotive manufacturers in, in Serbia. So, And that's because there's a lot of growth taking place there. Here in the US, you know, some states, Florida, Colorado, there, there, there's, there's, you know, a resurgence. There's definitely some growth taking place and we focused on some opportunities there yeah. too. Are you looking for more acquisitions? And if so, any particular targets or target industries? Yeah, definitely. We're actually targeting in, in, in those areas. So we're targeting a large utilities manufacturer in the Middle East. Uh, we're targeting a wildfire equipment and vehicle manufacturer in Southern Europe. Uh, it also has operations in Colorado, coincidentally. And we're targeting a large firefighting equipment and vehicle manufacturer in Florida. So together, those three companies would equate to about $150 million in annual revenue for us, substantial assets on our books. And obviously, they're in those growth areas that we've spoken about. So now I read this press release um, about the Quality Industrial Corp. You were just referring to it, QIND, yeah, QIND. ticker symbol. Um, they're skipping the QB stepping stone, planning a straight up list. Um, can you provide some context about that or maybe a timeline? Or, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. sure. So QIND, we about to announce the investment bank that's going to be, underwrite, be underwriting its offering. So I think by the time this video has aired or this interview has aired, that will have been announced. It will be filing a pre-14C, uh, its S1 registration statement and its NYC American application. Once the application and the S1, uh, well, the application is approved and the S1 registration statement is effective, Q, uh, QIND will be uplisting to, to the NYC. And how would that uplisting impact ILIS's shareholders and the financial outlook for the company? I'll touch on that now. Just quickly, you mentioned time frame. So we expect that, that uplisting to take place roughly between late August and the end of September. So all going well. If, if you look at the processes and how long they take, you know, mid, mid to late August is, is really would be the sweet spot for us in terms of, in terms of that uplisting. In terms of benefits to, to ILIS and uh, how it benefits the bottom line and the, and the shareholders, it obviously adds huge underlying value uh, to Eilis. I mean, Eilis is a company which already has over $250 million in assets, but we would expect, I certainly would expect that that uplisting would increase the balance sheet of Eilis. 
It also would allow Eilis, I mean, Eilis owns more than 70% of, of the stock in QIND. So it would allow Eilis to secure financing against that stock, which then means we can close some of the larger deals that we're currently targeting with. So it's, it's increased growth opportunities for the business, which is obviously of huge value for shareholders. But I also know that shareholders want tangible value, right? So uh, we're, we're currently discussing a dividend for Eilis shareholders that would take place around the uplisting. What about an ILIS uplisting? Would that put you in a position to list on a national exchange? And would you do that here in the US? Uh, mm. Yeah, we would We would okay. look at doing it uh, here in the US, certainly. We've actually got a very clear plan for ILIS to uplist to a national exchange still this year. Um, in the meantime, though, we've, we've uh, applied to uplist to the OTCQB. And uh, after the uplisting of QI and D, we'll focus then on, on, the, on the uplisting of ILIS to, to a national exchange. We've got a very out of the box method of being able to do it. I don't think anyone would really see it coming, but uh, the important thing is that you know, we get it up. It's, it meets all of the requirements as it is, except for on, uh, in terms of bid price. So, so the idea would be that through that out of the box solution, technically we'd, we'd be able to move it up to a national exchange. Okay, well, please on that. Definitely, it's very yeah, exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much, JP. Absolutely honored to be here. Thank yeah. you so much.